Hello and welcome to North Shore Fellowship's online service. We are glad that you are here. If you're watching on Facebook, would you click the like and the share buttons? And if you're watching on YouTube, would you share the link directly with a friend so that other people can find out what's happening here at North Shore Fellowship? Let's pray over today's service. Father, we thank you for this technology. We thank you for this service. We thank you for your church around the world, and we ask your blessings on your church. Father, help us today to open our ears, to hear the message, open our hearts to worship you, and receive what you have for us today. We ask these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship.
Well, welcome, friends. I want to talk to you about something unique today. It's not part of a series. It's just a message I want to share with you. And it's called Sweet Spot, Sweat Spot. That's right. Sweet Spot, Sweat Spot. And here's where I got the term sweet spot. We were planting a church in, in Franklin, Tennessee. And we finally got a building. And we finally renovated the building. And we opened the building. And we had a mystery guest speaker that night that not everybody knew who it was going to be. But when the person showed up, it was none other than Max Licato, a favorite, very successful Christian author of many people. And he gave this great word, a great message. And in it, he used the term sweet spot, finding your sweet spot. And here's what he says. He says, the world will tell you that you can be anything you want to be and do anything you want to do. And that is simply not true. The good news, however, is that you can be everything God wants you to be and do everything God wants you to do. And his plan for that is spectacular. You see, if we know God's purposes for our individual lives and we walk in them, we're essentially walking in our sweet spot. And we have this fulfillment and this sense of joy that we could have no other way. And Max also said this, people are those who do most what they do best do most what they do best. In other words, the thing that they do best, that's what they do a lot. And there's probably something that you are good at, something that you're particularly gifted in. It may be a job, a sport, an art, something creative, something more complicated, something that's cerebral or academic or intellectual. It may be something sentimental or emotional, some type of lane that you operate in that you get some type of sense of fulfillment and happiness because you're good at it and it's effective, it's extraordinary, and it's your sweet spot. And that's really what I want to talk to you about today, that your sweet spot may not be just some type of acquired academic skill that you learned or, or something that you've been instructed or where you got a degree in or something like that. It's basically something that comes from God. God has instructed you. God has taught you. God guides you into it. Psalm 28, I'm sorry, 32, 8, King David says this, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. In other words, there's a way that you should go, a particular way for you. And God's given us each special gifts and we're to use them to please him. We're also to use them to serve others. And we're, used, we're also to use them to reach the lost. In other words, we are to use the gifts God's given him for his purposes. His purposes is worshiping him, glorifying him, serving others, including the, and particularly the church body, and also to reach the lost. And he's given us these special gifts, and they are our sweet spot. When we operate in them, they're our sweet spot. Romans 12 talks about each one of us being uniquely gifted. Not all the same, not cookie cutter gifts for everybody, but unique extraordinary gifts. L listen to this verse from Romans 12, 6. <clears throat> we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. Okay, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. Now, if we look at the Greek word of the, the Greek words for two of those key words or phrases, you could read it this way. We have different charisma. <laughs> yeah, that's the gift word right there. Charisma according to the charis given to each of us. We have different charisma according to the charis given to each of us. Now, charis basically means gift or free gift. And, and interestingly enough, when you use the word charismatic, are you charismatic? You're basically saying gifts in motion. The gift that God's given you, instead of sitting on it and stuffing, in a, stuffing it, you're putting it in motion. And that's called being charismatic or gifts in motion. Now, I believe each one of us is given a gift. And I don't believe that some are better than others, more valuable than others, more special than others. In fact, Romans, I'm sorry, Acts, Acts 10, 34 tells us that God shows no favoritism. So each person is given an equal measure of gifts. Now, they may look differently. One might be a platform gift. One might be a behind the scenes gift. One might be a gift that is talked about. Often another gift is a little bit more covert but all of them are equal. It's like if God gave, you know, one person a $5 bill and another person a jar of 20 quarters, guess what? You each have five 
dollars. One can flash the, the big bill, the other can shake the coins. And that's kind of how it is with gifts. Some are more prominent or featured in, in public than others, but I believe everybody is gifted. And Jesus says that his purposes were clear. I've come to seek and save the lost. That's what he said. I've come to seek and save the lost. That's what he came to do. And when he left, he gave us the responsibility of doing the same thing. He expects us to seek and save the lost. Well, how do we do it? <clears throat> and the better question is, how does he do it through us? And the answer is, through the gifts that he's given us. And that basically means operate in your sweet spot, as opposed to operating in your sweat spot. So I better explain to you what I mean by sweet spot or sweat spot. Well, sweet spot's clear. It's your sweet spot. It's that thing you do. You really enjoy it because you're good at it. It doesn't require an inordinate amount of stress effort because it's effective when you use it. You don't have to strive for it. Uh, it's usually invigorating. It's inspiring when you do it. You could do it a lot without getting burned out. In fact, you might get energized by doing it. It's the thing that you do or the way that you operate that's it. it's extraordinary and unique. And you're probably complimented on it. People commend you on it. And you enjoy doing it. And it's fulfilling and rewarding. Sounds fun? <coughs> it is. That is your sweet spot. But what about your sweat spot? What is that? Your sweat spot is the thing that you do that you don't necessarily enjoy. But you do it because it has to be done or it's something you strived for. You may even have gotten good at it over time but it's not invigorating. It's probably uninspiring after over time and wearisome over time. You know what I mean? You get tired out quickly doing this. It may be something that's demanded on you because of your job or your normal responsibilities, but it doesn't energize you. It likely bores you. It may even drain you. And it may be something that you have training in. And some people even have a degree in something that's not their natural calling uh, like it might be in something else. So it's it's a sweat spot. It's something you, you've got to do. Where do I get that phrase sweat? I got it right from Genesis 3.19. This is the curse. After Adam and Eve had sinned and there was a curse upon them and the earth. And God says, by the sweat of your brow, you will eat. In other words, by sweating, by striving, by stressing, that's how you're going to be able to make a living. Now, every job has a percentage of their sweet spot responsibilities and their sweat spot responsibilities. The things you love to do and the things you have to do because it's your job. My job, same thing. I love to share the word and do music ministry. I can do that all day and I can do it even if I you know, won a million dollar lottery or retired, I'd still do that stuff. That's my sweet spot. My sweat spot are things I don't like doing, filling out expense reports or long Zoom meetings, you know, things like that. So when we operate more in our sweet spot and less in our sweat spot, well, we're invigorated. We have the joy of the Lord. I'm not saying this side of heaven that we can give up all our sweat spot responsibilities. We can't. We're all part of that curse. And what about mundane things like housework and chores? Can they be sweet spot, sweat spot? Yeah. I actually know people who like gardening. Do you like gardening? Some people like organizing things, closets and junk drawers and things like that. Some people like home repair. You know, something needs to be fixed. They can't wait to get the tools out and do it. Uh, other people hate those things. They despise those things. Why? Because it's not their sweet spot. What is it? It is their sweat spot. And how about you? What are your sweet spots? What are your sweat spots? Sometimes their sweet spots can become our sweat spots or vice versa. A sweat spot can become our sweet spot if you end up getting so good at it, you really enjoy it. Or you're paid so well that it's like that you don't like the job, but you like the sweetness of the paycheck. But most importantly, how about ministry? The ministry or the thing you do for the Lord, those eternal tasks that God's given us for his purposes, his kingdom. What is your spiritual sweet spot? And I'm talking about your spiritual gift. What is it you love to do? Because when you do it, it goes so well and it doesn't require an inordinate amount of stress effort. And, and it's also very effective. Listen to this quote. When you do more of what is in your sweet spot and less of what is in your sweat spot, you will be more effective and less stressed and have joy in the journey. So let's look at sweet spot in terms of spiritual gifts. Sweet spot in terms of spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians 12, starting with verse 4. 
There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of workings, but in all of them and in everything and everyone, it is the same God at work. So your sweet spot, again, is the part of your gift and calling from God that you absolutely enjoy. It invigorates you. Versus a sweat spot, which is basically just the mandatory work that you do. Again, from Genesis 3, the sweat of your brow. And I meet so many people who put themselves, deliberately put themselves into a position that they're not right for, out of selfish ambition or maybe wrong motives. And they find themselves doing something that is not their gift. So how do they do it? Well, they do it by striving to maintain it. They do it through their own strained ability. And even at that, they're still not even operating at their best. And that's a sad thing because operating in a gift that is not your own is not your sweet spot. It becomes your sweat spot. <clears throat> you know, try being a teacher if that's not your gift. You'll strive and strain. Try being an organizer or a leader if that's not your gift. Again, you will strive and strain to just try to maintain the, this. And sadly, I've seen people make the mistake of being fixated on a gift they didn't have, but they wish they had. They like the gift that somebody else has. That's what they want. And they're driven by ambition, maybe pride, and they try to achieve it on their own. And in some cases, they do. And, and it becomes unfruitful and burdensome and often ends in failure. And sometimes they get even get into a position that they were fixated on um, because of their own tenacity. They maybe have achieved this position or someone out of compassion places them there. You know, the analogy of the turtle on the fence post, the compassionate farmer sees the turtle trying to climb a fence post, says, I'll help the little guy. Sometimes that happens, but it's not the right thing. It's not the right place. And it's striving for something on your own that's not a gift, something given to you. I, have a, I had a friend who was um, very interested, not just interested, passionate about becoming a lead pastor. Now, it wasn't the person's gift, but it was the obsession that they had and striving and sending out 50 resumes and doing dozens and dozens of interviews, not getting a job, <coughs> finally getting a job that he wasn't completely satisfied with and, um, and didn't work out. And after a few years, uh, they dismissed him and he was, you know, bitter and, and dejected and all those things. But in the end, he said to me once, you know, I really was never intended to be a lead pastor. I, it was intended to be an executive pastor because this guy had brilliant, brilliant entrepreneurial gifts. Maybe not so much lead pastor gifts, but organizing, leading, establishing, just incredible. And sometimes you find out after a period of time, a season, that that was your gift or your, the, your obsession or your fixation was not your gift, but your calling your sweet spot really was. <coughs> the worst part, you ignore the real gift God has given you and just try to pursue a gift he hasn't given you. You never fully realize the full potential and the beauty and success and fulfillment that God has for you. I have a phrase I call, find your Michael Jordanism. Find your Michael Jordanism. <laughs> now, Michael Jordan, is, as you know, a legendary basketball player in the NBA. He played for the Chicago Bulls, and with the Bulls won six championships, and he's considered by many to be the greatest basketball player to ever play the game. Now, depending on what city you're from, you may disagree with that. I've never been from Chicago, but, and I'm not really a big basketball fan, but that's my understanding. Jordan was the best. And while he was on the court, he was unstoppable and seemingly unbeatable. And basketball was his sports calling. Now, I'm not saying it was his calling for his life. He probably had a spiritual calling that God created for him. But just use this as an example. Being a basketball player was his sweet spot. And he tried, after maybe getting bored with basketball, he tried to just set that aside and become a major league baseball player because he was pretty good. Pretty good. And he joined the minor leagues and he just never, never made it out of the minor leagues. He had like a 209 average, which is a low ranking minor leaguer. And so he was just kind of a, a low ranking minor league baseball player, 
when he could have been, uh, you know, the greatest basketball player. So he didn't go back to basketball. He went on to golf. He loved golfing. And he was, a, what I'm told, a pretty good golfer, but not nearly good enough to make the PGA Tour, the Professional Golfers Association Tour. So he never became a pro. So then he decided, well, basketball's my thing, but instead of playing, I'm just going to buy a basketball team, an NBA basketball team, and uh, become a part owner and, and, you know, maybe manage it with his basketball genius. And so he did, the Washington Wizards in 2000 and 2001. <clears throat> He's an owner, had tremendous influence, impact on the team. However, as a basketball owner, the Washington Wizards posted their worst record in franchise history. Now, why am I telling you all this? Because his sweet spot was playing basketball. Even if he tried to do other things, tried to go in different lanes, he didn't have anything near the success he had as a basketball player. And Michael Jordan's extraordinary skill was playing basketball. And it's similar to us with our spiritual giftings. I believe when you find your sweet spot and your spiritual giftings, you are, <laughs> quote unquote, Michael Jordan. That is your Michael Jordanism. And it's, it's something that's not, you know, um, when, it, when you seek something that's not specific to your calling, when you try to do someone else's calling or something other than, you will get this phrase, strive, not thrive. Strive, not thrive. Two words that rhyme mean the opposite. But when you operate in God's calling, God's sweet spot, his gifting, you will thrive, not strive. You will thrive. Example, that turtle on the fence post. He's up there. He might be up there higher than any turtle, but there's nothing he can do other than fall, which is sad. Now, in that, he may have gotten to his goal, but what's he going to do? He can't operate at his best. And oftentimes, that's what we're, we make the mistake of doing, trying to do something other than what God has gifted us to. And when we don't recognize our gift and our sweet spot, we're prone to do that. Listen to this quote. Our greatest moments will always be when we are doing the very thing we are called to do with the gifts God gave us to do them. When you're doing the very thing that you're called to do with the gifts God gave them, gave you to do them, you're living your greatest life. You're doing your greatest calling. But be careful that you don't become anxious or discouraged if it doesn't look exactly like you had hoped or come in the timing that you had hoped. And a lot of times God's given you a calling, given you a gift, but doesn't give you the opportunity to go through the open doors yet. I have this quote, very often times your most prolific purposes will come after many years of mundane moments. You know that. I'm all about alliterations. Get it? All about alliterations. Your most prolific purposes will come after many years of mundane moments. Let me give you an example. <clears throat> First Peter 5, 6. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. That due time is his time. And it may not be the time frame that you have. It may be, require waiting. It may require waiting. Think about Moses. He was 80 years old when he saw the burning bush and was chosen by God to go free his people and do all that incredible Moses stuff. He was 80 years old. 40 years prior to that was just sweat spot stuff, shepherding in Midian. How about Paul? Paul had been a believer, the Apostle Paul, for 17 years before he was commissioned by the elders in Jerusalem to go forth. Can you believe that? Now, he was doing ministry, but Galatians 2 adds up to about 17 years before he was given the right hand of fellowship and commissioning. Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah of the world, was 30 years old when he began his ministry. I mean, when he was baptized and sent forth, he was 30 years old. He had to wait until that right moment. And what about Joseph? Now, Joseph had a lot of sweat spot jobs before he got his sweet spot job. I'm talking about Joseph, you know, from the Old Testament, Joseph, son of Jacob, who had a you know, ter terrible life. I mean, he was, he was initially hated by his brothers because they were jealous because his father seemed to love him best. His, his brothers tried to kill him, eventually sold him into slavery. But his life, think about it, up until the point where he was the Joseph second command of Egypt, first he was a shepherd, 
then he became a slave, then he became an overseer in Potiphar's house, but then he became a prisoner, and then he was the leader of the prisoners, then he was a dream interpreter. Interpreter. All of these are sweat spot jobs until he became the second in command of, of, of Egypt by interpreting those dreams. In fact, I would say that the dream interpretation was a sweet spot of his that led to his success. And that's why he says in Genesis 50, 20, but as for you, he's talking to his brothers, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. I love it. Remember that your purposes and plans and, and gifts are very different, possibly very different than the ones you had in mind. And his timing is probably different than the timing you had in mind. That's why he requires patience and obedience in order to fulfill his calling. I know it seems as though you would want to get the thing that you would hope you'd get in the timing that you'd hope and your life would be exactly as you envision, but that's not always the case. It's not always the case. Um, it's God's timing and his, his ways. Our responsibility is to be patient and obedient. And remember this, our success is not guaranteed. You know, the Bible's filled with people who responded in obedience and experienced God's blessing, but there's also people who rejected God's plan, maybe out of fear or just disobedience or unwillingness, and instead of experiencing blessing, they experienced consequences. And you can read all about that through the scriptures. God's plans require three things. I say this often. Willingness, obedience, and availability. Willingness, obedience, and availability. And it's possible to even forfeit a plan that God has for you. And it won't even come about if we're not willing, obedient, and available. Think about Esther. Now, she saved the Jewish people in Persia. She saved them. But that was by speaking up. She could have easily forfeited by remaining silent. In fact, if she did remain silent instead of speaking up, things would have been different. How do I know that? Esther 4.14. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. And who knows if perhaps you have come into the kingdom for such a time as this. So, in other words, our success is contingent upon our willingness, availability, and our obedience. And let me just end with these things about discovering your spiritual gifts. Because I do believe your sweet spot is enabled by your spiritual gift. When the Holy Spirit empowers your spiritual gift, it unleashes your sweet spot. It reveals what your sweet spot is. In Romans, we see that there's seven motivational gifts. Seven. I know that sounds like too finite of a number. Maybe there's more. But at least in this por portion of Scripture, here's what's put forth. And Romans 12, 4 through 8 says this. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in ministry. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, and he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. So what you saw in Romans 12, 4 through 8 were seven gifts that were put forth, that were literally put forth so we are part of a body that is serving one another and the gifts are functioning to help one another. Let me just list them now as a list. Number one, prophecy. It's not necessarily foretelling the future. Prophecy, speaking forth truth. Speaking forth truth. That may be your gift. Ministry. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're a minister by title, but ministry is serving and meeting practical needs ministering to people, serving and meeting their practical needs. Teaching. Again, you might not have the title teaching or teacher. In fact, <clears throat> we're all uh, 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 elders, I should say. Requirement is apt to teach, able to teach. When we do the Great Commission, it says go and make disciples, teach them all I've commanded them. But teaching as a gift, it may be your sweet spot. You're able to 
do the research and clarify truth, clarifying truth. That may be a sweet spot of yours. Number four, exhorting or encouraging. Same word, exhorting. And that means building up faith in someone else. You see them, you're like a personal trainer, building up their faith. Number five, giving. I know it doesn't sound spiritual, but some people are able to provide resources or connect resources for the kingdom of God. It's a gift that certain people have. Number six, leading. Leading. And leading doesn't just mean that I'm the leader, I'm the ruler, I'm the top dude, I'm the top guy. No, no, no. Leading is organizing and, 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 and uh, coordinating events, creating a system by which other people can flow in ministry, leading. And then the last one, seven, mercy. We're all to have mercy, mercy. we're all to be merciful. However, there are certain people that have this gift of empathizing and sharing and ministering to others with emotional stress. And you know, someone with that kind of sweet spot might find themselves as a counselor or some type of um, you know, advocate or aid of people in need, things like that. And each one of us has one of these primary motiv motivational gifts. And from this, you can operate in your sweet spot. Now, God gave it to you. He built it into you. And one of these things, and you go look at that list, one of them comes very easily to you, or at least more easily than the others. Why? Because when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, He supercharges the gift within us. He supercharges it, and we become way more effective than we can through our normal human faculties. And I mean your an intellect, your emotional uh, skill, or your natural skill. Operating in your motivational gift is operating in the spiritual gift, and that is your sweet spot. So take a, an honest look at you. Really, what you love to do, what you don't like to do, what you're good at and effective in, what you strive for or in, ineffective in, and you'll, you'll likely find what is your sweet spot and what is your sweat spot. Take a, uh, a, a, a spiritual gift test. There's a lot of them out there, some that are better than others, but find one that's reputable. And take it, just go online, you fill out a bunch of questions and they may tell you what is your motivational gift. Probably use Romans 12 as a model. Now you may feel like you have none of the gifts or maybe some of them. I believe Jesus is the only one that had all of them, but the rest of us, I believe, have one primary gift. And from that, you find your sweet spot. You find your, you know, Michael Jordanism. And the truth is, as followers of Jesus, we're often called to operate in many of these gifts, several of them. And sometimes the Holy Spirit gives us the manifestations to teach when we're not a teacher or to lead when we're not a leader. But there is something on that list that you have in abundance because it is your gift. And remember, your gift is what enables your sweet spot. So I, I strongly encourage you to to know your gift, find out what your gift is, and also understand what it, it is not. You know, sometimes our greatest strengths are knowing our weaknesses. Our greatest strength are knowing our weaknesses. And if you're trying to operate in a gift that's not your own, that is a weakness. But operate in your lane, in your strength, in your forte, as they say, that's a gift. And only then you can focus on it and run full speed in the purposes and the calling that God has for your life the gift that he's really gifted with you with, not just what you hoped it would be or strived for. So if you don't know your gift or you don't know how or where to use it, ask the Lord to reveal it to you. Ask him to give you clear vision on how he's gifted you and how do you use it with power and purpose here on earth for his kingdom, just like it is in heaven. So my prayer for you today is that you fully know your gift and you know the calling, the gift and the calling that he has on your life and that you will be exceedingly fruitful and effective as you walk in your sweet spot every day of this new season. May God bless you.
Friend, thanks for being part of North Shore Fellowship Online. I'm glad that you were part of this service. Hope you enjoyed the worship and the teaching and the announcements. In fact, roll back to those announcements because there's so many great things happening and I want you to be part of them. I want you to come out and enjoy that with us. But also, if you have any questions about what we talked about or you want to pray, especially about committing your life to Jesus, I'm ready to receive your call or your email or your chat request or whatever it is. Just reach out and I'll find you and we'll pray and I'll lead you in a prayer of salvation. The greatest prayer that you'll ever make in your life on this side of heaven and then also into eternity. God bless you.